Hello, and thank you for coming. Um, I would like to introduce our two speakers, and um, I will keep this short. Um, our first speaker is Timo um, Riesenen, who is a professor of fashion design and sustainability at the Parsons School of Design. Um, he is a fashion designer in his own right and has also curated exhibitions such as Yield and No Waste, Timo. Um, and we also have Michael Brooker, who is an Indianapolis um, resident and also part-time resident of Austin, Texas. And Michael uh, created the organization People for Urban Progress and has been responsible for initiatives in town, um, such as the Dome uh, Fabric Revitalization Project and also um, responsible for repurposing uh, the seats in Bush Stadium to be used as seating for um, Indianapolis transit stops. Michael. So tonight we will be begin uh, with Timo's presentation, um, followed by Michael's presentation, and then we will open it up to uh, questions. Great. Thank you so much, Petra, for the introduction, and, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm not going to read from my notes, but um, I have a terrible habit of going on, on very long-winded tangents. and. Um, Sometimes I have even greater trouble getting back from them. So um, um, the notes are there to ensure that um, I stay here. Um, as Petra mentioned, um, I'm the assistant professor of fashion design and sustainability at Parsons in New York, and um, and the position was created um, three years ago, and I'm the first person in that role. And um, it's an amazing job because really I get to see on a daily basis that a lot of the changes that you know get talked about a lot, I actually get to see them happening um, really every day in my job. So I, I really love what I do. Um, now I'm going to juggle um, a few things. Um, I'm going to dive straight in because I'm going to keep this fairly brief. Um, so obviously, when it comes to waste or trash, something is not working. And um, you know, if we look at this image as our probable future when it comes to waste, you know, could we live with this? Because um, obviously, this man in the image, he is living with this. Um, so it is possible. Um, Um, and this could be one, one um, possible future if something isn't, isn't done about the situation. I think one of the, the issues with waste, and um, Anne kind of touched on it when she introduced the evening, um, she, said, she used the phrase, um, throwing things away. And, um, and, you know, it's a phrase that we all use without much, thinking about it very much at all, um, quite often. Um, and, and my question regarding throwing things away is, where is the away? And this is obviously one example of a way. And then another one would be um, this. And I apologize, we did do training where I'm not meant to point there because the thing is over there. Um, and now I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about this image. It's by Chris Jordan, an amazing photographer. He's done some incredibly beautiful series about things that aren't that beautiful. Um, this is from Midway, which is in the Pacific Ocean. It's part of the, geologically, it's part of the Hawaiian Islands. And, um, and Hawaii and, and Midway are in the middle of what's called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch which is basically this floating mass of plastic in the Pacific Ocean. Um, nobody's exactly sure how big it is. Um, the most often quoted um, size for it is it's twice the size of Texas. So it's basically where the currents in the Pacific, um, it's in the center, center of the current, so nothing is moving very much. Um, and so the plastic just sort of floats around in the ocean. On Midway, there's a massive albatross colony and albatross, when they're breeding, they feed their chicks um, squid and mollusks. 
And with all this floating plastic, um, the albatross actually mistake the plastic for the stuff that they would normally feed to their chicks. And what happens over time, as the chicks ingest the plastic, which they can't digest, um, eventually they get filled with it and unfortunately they die. And this is not an isolated photograph. Um, Chris Jordan did a whole series of photographs of, of these mummified albatross chicks on Midway, all full of plastic. So this is another example of the away that we talk about when we say that we throw things away. Now, I think another important question to ask um, is how does waste actually come into existence? And Susan Strasser has, has put it very succinctly in saying that trash is created by sorting. So it's those decisions that we make on a daily basis, oh, I no longer need this, or I no longer want this. That's a form of sorting um, through our personal stuff. And um, going back to fashion, which is my field, um, I quite often use this particular image of these bales of clothing um, with my students and say, this is your portfolio, um, because this is where the things that you design will end up in. And um, this is from a textile sorting facility somewhere in the United States. I visited a similar facility in New Jersey last year in August, and they sort through 30,000 pounds of clothes every day. And it really looks like that. Um, it's incredibly... Um, it, it really hits home when you start to see the, the size of the bales and they're, you know, they're, they're seven, eight feet high and, and, um, and when, when they tell you that it's 30,000 pounds a day, it really, you get a sense of the scale because um, that's just one plant in New Jersey but when you start to think about it globally, the, the numbers get really staggering. I'll just briefly touch on the kind of work that I've done. So really, if we look at textile waste, uh, the two broad categories are pre-consumer waste and post-consumer waste. And my particular research has been focusing on, on um, the pre-consumer waste, which is the waste that the fashion industry creates when we uh, make garments. And then post-consumer waste refers to the kind of waste you saw in the previous picture, which is second-hand garments for the most part. And um, um, the images on this slide, uh, the top one is the pre-consumer waste that I, I've been researching and you know, how, what I've really been researching is how to eliminate that waste through design. Um, those are neoprene offcuts uh, from the Rip Curl uh, wetsuit factory in Australia. And um, we, we did a project when I, back when I still lived in Australia um, working at UTS in Sydney. We worked with Rip Curl, uh, where they donated their waste from the factory to the students, and the students created all sorts of things, including this installation. And then um, the image on the bottom is from an exhibition that took place in Chicago last year, and um, it was called Zero Waste, and this was an installation by Derek Melander. And um, it, this thing took, this installation took a week to create, and. Um, that there was a whole team working on it. And if you go to the Columbia College Chicago website, there's actually a video of that week of this piece being created um, from secondhand clothing. So it's quite a beautiful process because you, as you can see from the images, when you're inside the gallery, you, all you see is just this pile of secondhand clothing. But when you walk past the gallery on the street, you see this incredibly beautiful sorting by color that's happened, which is not unlike the bales in the previous, previous image. Um, so there, there was kind of a tension between this, just the heap of stuff and then this, you know, really beautiful, aesthetically pleasing thing on, on the outside. And um, what I really loved about this piece too was that once the exhibition finished, all of the clothes went back to the second-hand store where they had come from as well. So this is um, really the waste that I've been looking at, as I mentioned, so the uh, pre-consumer fabric waste that the fashion industry, um, and I include myself in that, that we create. Um, so this is a cutting lay plan for, um, for a raglan sleeve top um, in three sizes, so the uh, three different colors indicate the three different sizes. 
and the white that you see is all of the fabric that's wasted when these um, garments are cut. And um, on average, the industry wastes about 15% of the fabric that it uses to make the garments that um, we fashion designers design. And when you start to think about the billions of garments um, made every year globally, that 15% is actually, we're talking about a huge amount of wasted, it's not just wasted fabric, it's wasted resources or investments of resources, things like, I mean, the, the actual raw material, and, but also things like water, energy, and also I would say human, human resources, because every fabric is designed by someone. So I would, I would argue that, you know, that 15% includes a waste of, of those people's time and also the labor that went into generating the fiber, whether, it, whether it's a natural fiber, for example, cotton grown in a field or, um, or a synthetic man-made fiber like polyester, which is created from um, crude oil. Regardless, there's always those human, human resources that are embodied in that 15% of wasted fabric. So my question in this conversation then is what's missing from this picture? And, um, and I'm going on a bit of a limb here because um, I've obviously been talking about um, fabric waste and also you know, fashion waste for a number of years. And what I've started to see, and I've had some very generous people around me kind of pointing this out as well, is that I'm very good at pointing the finger at uh, various stakeholders, but I, what, what I didn't realize for a long time I was doing, I was really just dis disempowering people in the conversation. And so quite recently what I've committed to doing is creating conversations that aim to be empowering for everyone that's involved in the conversation because it's very easy for us, for all of us, just as human beings, to get caught up in our own opinions and points of views and feelings and emotions about things. And, and um, when I pose this question, what is missing from the conversation, I don't mean what's wrong with the conversation. The missing is something that if it were there, it would make a difference. And um, I'll, I'll propose some some of the things that I believe are missing from the conversation, but you know, once we get to the conversation part where you guys play a crucial role, um, I'm hoping to hear some other things that might be missing as well. But starting with what I think is missing, um, I think one of the crucial things that's missing from the conversation is um, beauty. Because if you start looking or thinking about that 15% of wasted fabric in itself, like that whole practice of designing something and then making it and not even giving any thought to the 15% of fabric being wasted in the process, I think what's missing is beauty from that process. Um, and I use this visual example. Uh, this was from an exhibition I did as part of my PhD four years ago in Australia where the exhibition itself was zero waste garments, but I did make this one piece, which is the coat on the left, which I designed in a conventional manner, and then the waste that was created um, as part of, the, part of the design and making process, I deliberately tried to create as ugly a thing out of it as I could, which is the waistcoat that you see. Um, and um, it actually hung in the university for a month and it was really ugly. Um, I think a lot of people were relieved when the, when the whole thing came down because it was actually the central staircase in the university where these things hung. Um, so beauty, I would say, is the first thing that's missing. And, and just in general in fashion, um, I think even though we, as an industry, propose to be an industry that's about beauty, when you actually look at the industry, there's a whole lot of beauty missing because, for example, what a lot of people don't know is um, a, a substantial amount of cotton that we wear. You know, most T-shirts, for example, are cotton. A lot of cotton comes from Uzbekistan where, on one hand, the Aral Sea, which used to be the fourth largest inland lake, um, has nearly dried up because of irrigation for the cotton industry. And at least up until 2008, the Uzbekistan government was um, 
closing some schools to take the children out of the schools to go into the cotton fields to pick cotton for no pay. Um, whether that's still happening, the, the, this is based on reports that were published in 2008, so whether that's still happening, I'm not sure. But um, certainly it's easy to argue that there's beauty missing in that as well. Um, even if the garments made from that cotton might appear to us visually pleasing. The second thing that I propose is missing is curious engagement with the world around us. And um, I go back here to um, things that I discovered as part of my undergraduate studies in the late 90s, and particularly images like this. So these rectangles, um, when you first look at them, you don't really think that there's a dress there, but there actually is. Um, and it's addressed by Madeleine Vianney, who was a French designer in the early 20th century. And, um, and what was, um, I think, significant for me discovering this, this work by Vianney, documented by um, a woman called Betty Kirk, was the realization that you could cut fabric on the straight grain. So um, I, I don't know how technically um, jargony I'm getting here, but um, basically the grain of the fabric is the, if you've got a roll of fabric, it's the basically the grain follows the two sides of the fabric. And that's the most conventional direction to cut the garment pieces in. But then if you cut it on a 45 degree angle, which is called the bias, it actually has a lot of elasticity in it. But the problem with bias cutting is that it tends to be very wasteful. A VNA back in 1918 showed an example of cutting fabric on the straight grain but hanging it on the bias. Um, and even though this wasn't a zero waste garment, I recognize that there's, looking at Viennese work, there's a lot to be learned about how to be more respectful of the fabric that we fashion designers use. So curious engagement was what I'm proposing as missing there. And next what I'm proposing as missing is fun. So the two images that you see here now are actually the shirt that I'm wearing um, when it was being made in New Zealand last July. I was there for a two-week intensive with two incredible designers, um, Julian Roberts from the Royal College in London and Holly McQuillan from Massey University um, in New Zealand. And um, Petra mentioned the, the Yield exhibition. That was something I co-curated with Holly McQuillan. And we did this two-week intensive where we just made things for the fun of it. I mean, there was a research component to it, but really one of the key things for us was to have fun because so much of academia tends to get caught up in its own seriousness that we recognize the need for us as human beings to you know, do, what it is, do what we love but also have fun doing it. And, um, and certainly for me, you know, trying to negotiate the pieces of a garment within the width of the fabric, which is what zero waste fashion design is, it's actually a fun process it, because I, I see it as a game. But I also see that if that kind of fun could be applied to how we look at all of the waste, not just in fashion but as a society, because they are all interlinked, um, I think if we bring fun into the picture, then, then we might actually start moving forward a lot faster. And then my last proposed missing is commitment. Janelle Abbott was a student in the first Zero Waste course that I taught back in 2010 at Parsons. And then in the past year, she was one of my seniors in the core thesis class that I also teach. And um, what was really remarkable about Jan Janelle was that she didn't just do Zero Waste for her thesis collection, but she actually took what I had taught her and invented her own ways of working around zero waste. And so she produced 11 looks for her thesis collection and all, every single garment in the collection was zero waste. And um, not only that, but every fabric in her collection was found. Um, she's a freegan, uh, meaning that she doesn't pay for anything, including food. And, um, and that's actually very easy in New York. I've had a lot of conversations with her. Um, there's an incredible amount of food being thrown away in New York City. And um, she would come to class with the most amazing cupcakes and um, pe other pastries and things and share them with the class. And, you know, once we got over our, our um, prejudices against, <laughs> against eating trash, um, you know, we, we had a really fun year. 
Um, and Janela is actually going to be part of an installation that I'm currently working on for an exhibition in Finland. So that's right. I, she's going to be in the installation for three months, um, sewing T-shirts. <laughs> so she's going to be part of the artwork. Um, but what really, what I got from her, um, I don't even feel like I taught her. It was just this amazing conversation for a year that I had with her. But what I really got from her was commitment. And, um, and that's something that I think we need to bring back to the conversation as well. So those were the four things that I propose are missing from the conversations that we have. Um, beauty, curious engagement, fun and commitment. Now, what might that look like if we bring those in? So from nothing, what's now possible? And I'll explain the purpose of this image, because really this is something that was created from nothing. Um, these birds that you see, they're hooping cranes. Um, it's a species of crane native, uh, native to North America. But um, the last remaining population actually nests in Canada and migrates to Texas every year. And um, cranes are one of those birds that actually learn the migration routes from their parents. And so when a population dies out, that knowledge dies out as well. And so even 20 years ago, when I was going to become a biologist, um, before I got distracted by fashion, um, you know, the conversation was that it wasn't possible for whooping cranes ever to exist as a breeding species in the United States. In 2001, an organization called Operation Migration started teaching young cranes to migrate from Wisconsin to Florida following these ultralights. Um, the person flying the ultralight is wearing a white cape and one of the sleeves looks like a crane head. So these cranes think that the plane is their parent and they actually follow the plane from Wisconsin to Florida. It's about 1,200 miles that they fly. and. Um, and they actually migrate through Indiana as well. Or uh, The official migration route used to go through Indiana. It changed a couple of years ago, but um, a lot of the birds that learned it through Indiana, they still come here every spring and fall as well. So it's a beautiful example of creating something, something from nothing. And, and it's one of those projects that, for me, is just an endless source of optimism. Um, if you go to operationmigration.org, there's actually amazing images of the chicks that hatched um, over the last two weeks in Wisconsin. Um, the project is really working. And I think that kind of inspiration we can bring into the conversations around waste as well. I'm just about to going to wrap, wrap it up. Um, I think going back to what I'm proposing, this quote by a colleague of mine, and he was also my first PhD advisor, Cameron Tonkin was, um, design timely things, things that can last longer by being able to change over time, design things that are not finished, things that can keep on by keeping on being repaired and altered things in motion, um, refers to the kind of um, behaviors that we also need to start looking at around the things that we own, not just clothes. And the coat in the image is from Japan, and these coats used to be in the same family for several generations. Um, some of these coats um, have been studied by um, people who can tell a lot, a lot just by looking at these things under a microscope, and they can tell that some of these uh, coats were actually in use for a century. Um, which is a totally different kind of relationship to clothing that we mostly tend to have nowadays. There are some contemporary examples. Um, the, the man in this picture is um, Edward, and this is what he calls his three-stage jacket. It was actually a waistcoat 40 years ago, and then when Edward put on some weight, he um, split the waistcoat through the back and knitted the panel that you can see in the photograph. And then about 15 years ago, he added the sleeves um, to keep himself warm. And, um, and these kinds of behaviors, they exist around the world. Um, most of us have something equally ingenious in our closets. And Local Wisdom um, is a research project where Kate Fletcher from London College of Fashion uncovered this. And, um, and we're about to embark on a collaboration for the next two years documenting these kinds of ingenious um, behaviors and practices among everyday people um, um, here in, in the United States. Um, California College of the Arts is also um, part of the project in San Francisco. 
So keep your eye out on that. The website is uh, localwisdom.info. And, um, and it'll be really interesting to see, because America tends to, I can say as a, an outsider, um, well, a former outsider, that um, outside of America, America tends to be seen as the culmination of conspicuous consumption and, and really wasteful. But I know from the amazing two and a half years that I have had here that um, there's some incredible things and incredible innovation, which I think we're about to hear about here in a minute, happening in this country as well. And that needs to be recognized, talked about and um, acknowledged. So. Um, on that note, um, I'm sorry, I think I went a little bit over time, but um, Not a problem. I am complete. Okay. Excellent. So I'll jump in here in a minute. Um, uh, so again, my name is Michael. Um, I uh, co-founded an organization here in Indianapolis called People for Urban Progress, um, and I think there's a team of us here in front. Um, so thanks uh, to Anne and Petra uh, for having us here. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, this notion of um, kind of uh, executing an idea or this link between idea and impact, uh, uh, which is something that we talk about in our office every day. Um, and and uh, we didn't, somehow along the way, almost inadvertently, fashion became a mechanism for us to connect an idea into this impact. Um, so, uh, so for us, I'm gonna, I, when I talk about the work that we do, I often talk about the consequence of the work that we do, and today I'm gonna try and focus a little bit more on the process, um, because we think um, our process is actually pretty interesting, and um, I'm gonna focus on the, the RCA dome material uh, for when that building was demolished. Um, in 2008, we're the organization that um, worked with a number of different people to salvage that material and turn it into a number of things, and I, and I brought some stuff that I'll show you in a minute. Um, and that has snowballed into other projects um, that we, uh, and, and waste that we've kind of adopted. Um, we're particularly interested uh, in materials that um, have to do with the um, kind of mythology and history of Indianapolis. Um, and we're finding uh, more and more of these uh, as, as we get older. Um, and so we started you know, in 2008 uh, with this notion of you know, what was going to happen to the roof of the RCA dome when it was coming down. Um, and it's a material called Teflon coated fiberglass. And um, there's about uh, 15 acres of, of this material that was sus suspended there. And so our, our idea really started as this question of what is that stuff and can anything uh, can anything be made out of it? Um, and, and really uh, provoking the city to, to be a little bit more responsible and, and stepping up and say, you know, this, this just can't happen, right? This material, this is so much material that I felt like in any other country, um, it would be no question that material would be saved. It would be viewed as a resource, you know, almost immediately. I mean, it's a, it's a roof, you know, it's fundamentally shelter. Um, and I like this image a lot because you can kind of see the old and the new, you know, how quickly we kind of forget um, what came before, you know. Um, and so again, this kind of progression from idea into resource uh, and, and viewing this instead of as trash, you know, viewing it as a resource. Um, and there at the top there, there's, I'm going to have this running list of different organizations that, that worked with us, that we partnered with to kind of make this happen. And I think this list is emblematic of uh, all of our projects, you know, that we're not kind of doing this uh, alone. Um, so to this graphic on the side is, is this graphic intended to show how we're kind of chopping up this material, uh, this roof of the RCA dome and thinking about it differently. Um, so here's a picture um, when we were on the inside. Um, you can see the, the roof was two layers thick and we found out it was two different materials, a softer material, inner membrane and a, and a harder membrane on the outside. Um, and, and so the first step, you know, I, I could show you a picture of that and then show you a bag, but then it's like there's so many things that happen in between, you know, that I think we're still amazed that we're still doing this because there are so many steps. Um, and so the first step was kind of transporting it uh, once we were, um, once we worked with the demolition company to save it, you know, there's a whole series of problems that kind of snowball. So they said, yes, you can have it, but you have to transport it. And so we worked with the parks department, we're able to transport the material, and then that's um, only about five of the 13 acres that we salvaged 
uh, right there. Um, and so our, our first idea was to take this material and immediately put it back into the city in the form of shade structures and pavilions. And, and we quickly realized that that's very expensive um, and we needed a, a, a kind of, again, a kind of mechanism to get from you know, A to B. Um, and so we said, well, we can't afford um, to make something big, so let's make something small um, and, and use that small thing to help uh, fund the big thing. Um, and this is kind of a, a continuously evolving business model for kind of who we are as a nonprofit. Like, is there a way uh, for us to take waste, make a small thing out of it, and then turn that into revenue and jobs for local creatives uh, to, to have a larger impact? Um, and so the process for turning the material into uh, a product, we have, um, you know, us cutting the material in the front yard of my house, um, and then that's my Jeep, and we're like at a car wash cleaning it. Um, and again, like we can't even think about the how small like an amount of material that is compared to how much we have, uh, because it's just too mind-boggling. Um, I'm asked all the time how much of the material you know have we used, um, and of the uh, 13 acres, we think we've used less than one percent. Um, and we've, I think, made over 4,000 products. Um, so it, it is an, an ongoing uh, an effort. Um, so the next step is, uh, and we started out actually hand cutting everything. And um, I think our first 1,000 products were all hand cut. And that took you know, a lot of time. So to make one wallet was nine pieces. And it took about two and a half hours to make. Um, and quickly we realized, uh, in a way, not only was that wasteful, but um, it, it took too long, you know. Um, and so we started working with a group um, in Muncie called Project One um, to laser cut the material. And so we, we kind of reformatted how we worked and, and we're cutting the pieces in sheets and then, you know, working with them and working on the computer to kind of maximize the amount of material as possible. Um, and so up here you can kind of see some of the pieces that are laser cut and then what that um, design product uh, turns out to be. So there's a clutch there. Um, and there's three of our team in our studio. Um, we have only three sewing machines that we make all of our products on and then they are working, uh, working away. Um, and I think now we have about six designers working for us, all mostly part time. Um, and, and they're the ones really designing, designing the product, you know, and, and uh, and we all kind of work as a team and troubleshoot together and, and figure out which products we think are the next one to, to come out with. And, you know, we, we, I think we look back and see these really crude wallets and clutches that we started out with and, and, and realizing over time we've kind of um, not only gotten more efficient but have uh, improved the design. Um, and I think we're all really proud of the quality of the design, um, which is a huge, which is something I think we could talk about later is kind of, um, the relationship between quality and repurposing something. Um, so there's kind of some of our first round of products there um, and how they've evolved. Um, so we found kind of from this one product, um, we suddenly have like a project and, and it took essentially two and a half years for us to come back to this original goal which was to uh, put shade structures um, out in the city because um, we're uh, we're an organization that is very much about improving the the urban quality of life um, and and so our products really again are just a mechanism for us to do that they're not the the end goal um, and so I like thinking about you know the RCA dome exploding across the city and, and continuing to benefit the public um, because in a way the public paid for that building and I think continues to pay for it, I'm not sure. Um, uh, and so, so again, it's about a, about a cause and a, and a real effort here to improve our public spaces in the city. Um, and so we've expanded to larger uh, pavilions um, and this is kind of under construction right now. Um, and that's my sister tying that up there. Um, and, and so this is at the Concord Farm on South Meridian Street and um, this is essentially where, uh, on that farm, where the produce is going to go um, after, you know, when they need to clean and process the material, they needed a pavilion. Um, and we're learning a lot through this project. It's taken us a little longer to get it out of the ground. Um, 
but we are using, you can see here, the same material that our bags are made out of. Um, and with this project in particular, uh, if you, anybody who bought any of the first thousand items we made actually helped pay for this structure. Uh, and so we're really interested in this link between, um, or almost the subversiveness of fashion as an object, where if you buy something that we made, um, you're helping be, you're helping um, be more responsible and sustainable almost just by having it, um, which uh, I think is really cool. <laughs> um, so again, that, that kind of gives us, gets us to impact. Uh, and, and, and it's got us thinking like, what else can we do? Um, or, or how else can we use this example of something small, uh, making something small and kind of um, turning it into revenue to help pay for something big? Um, and so that has happened um, quickly now. We've, we've, um, we're almost overwhelmed with materials. And so we were contacted about two weeks before the Super Bowl um, saying that all of uh, the fabric in the Super Bowl and Convention Center um, didn't have a home. And so I got a phone call literally from the NFL's like chief of environment or whatever he's called. And, and, and he, he was like, so we have all this material. We don't even know how much it is. It was all printed just for you know, the two weeks of, of the Super Bowl. Um, we have no plan for it. Do you want it? Um, and I'm like, uh, I have to decide right now. You know, like, and, and he essentially, you know, he was great, but he was like, yeah, if you're not going to take it, then it's going to go to a landfill. And so we you know, quickly said, don't throw it away. We'll figure out a way to, to to save it. Um, and so there it is. And when, when I spoke to him on the phone, he told us that it was probably only going to be a, about eight pallets of material. Um, and it turned out to be 49. Um, and uh, I think we've gone through maybe two or three uh, of the pallets. Um, and he estimated, too, that it's about five miles of material. Um, and so we have, um, you know, I don't, what, you know, 13 acres of RCA dome fabric on the one hand, and now five miles of, uh, you know, material from the Super Bowl. Um, and this material is quite different than the RCA dome material because it has no structural properties. So we cannot take this material and turn it into, you know, a shade structure. Um, so we have to come up with kind of other larger scale uses for the material. Um, and so this is a material called, that they use this fence wrap, which is essentially a mesh material. Um, and we turn that into shower curtains um, there. And then some of our other products there where we're now merging actually material from the RCA down with material from the Super Bowl. Um, and then two other projects I'll talk about really briefly. If we didn't have enough materials, um, we just recently worked with a group called Ecolaborative uh, and Indianapolis Fabrications and Recycle Force to help um, salvage um, nine of the 11,000 seats here in Bush Stadium. Um, with the notion um, that they could be repurposed at bus stops throughout uh, the city of Indianapolis here. Um, and I think, too, this gets to your notion of fun. You know, I think this is a really um, fun way to remind people that we have a public transit system um, and, that, um, and that they are they are doing a good job with the resources that they have, uh, but we spend a lot of time in the city talking about a long range light rail plan that's you know, 25 years away. Um, and we're really interested in, well, what could we do you know, next week or next month to at least you know, tell the public or tell ourselves that like, something can be done in that gap, you know, that, that we can make a difference between now and 25 years from now. Um, and so we think this is a really good example of that possibility. Um, and and I, so this is the first set of four that has been installed and refurbished. Um, and there are four more sets of four that are gonna go in, I think, this summer. Um, and we're working with Indigo to roll out a, a sponsorship program where different companies could actually sponsor to have a set of these at the bus stop um, uh, in front of their business. Um, and I think, too, I don't remember the exact statistics, but I think out of um, something like 4,000 bus stops, only 200 of them have any sort of amenity. Um, and so there's a real need, again, for, for a solution like this. Um, I think that's the last slide I have. And, and one more project that we're doing um, 
uh, is we've um, worked with the city. We're getting about 80 of the city's old parking meters, uh, the original ones that, that crank. Um, and we're going to do uh, an installation of those meters somewhere downtown where people could still put money in the meter uh, and it will light up and that money will go to some sort of um, nonprofit or organization or cause. We're still kind of working out the, the logistics of that. But again, taking something that this, really that the city viewed as trash, you know, um, and, and turning that into something fun, something that um, kind of honors the, the, the history of the city um, and that helps the public uh, think about sustainability and their, their uh, urban waste a little differently. Thank you. So this is an indie talk, and we very much want your participation. Um, and so if you see me playing on this iPad up here, it's because I am intercepting tweets. I'm not playing Angry Birds, I swear. Um, but I'd like to ask if there's anyone in the audience who wants to start us off with a question for either Timo or Michael. Yes. Did everyone hear that question? Yeah, okay. Um, in short, the answer I think is education. Um, because if it's not on the designer's radar, and also if, if that whole practice of this is how you design a garment, you know, you make a sketch and then usually someone else makes a pattern for it and then somebody else cuts it, quite often in a different country. So the designer doesn't even get to see the amount of waste that's created. Um, I think that's part of the problem. Because um, I've had conversations with designers and they really, it's not even been on, on their radar, but once you actually have a conversation, they do tend to get interested. And I've had some very surprising designers come to me um, and also reaching out to Parsons um, to help them. So this is actual corporations and, and companies who want to know more about Zero Waste. So things are definitely shifting compared to eight years ago when I started my PhD, where even my one of my advisors didn't even know what my PhD was about for the first four months. And then when she realized what it was about, she was really kind of terrified that I didn't really have a PhD on my hands. Um, so things have really shifted in, in, in the last decade, and, and even companies that you wouldn't expect to really care based on the kind of business practices and that they engage in are starting to shift as well. Um, slightly outside of waste, but still, you know, still within the same conversation. Last year, Greenpeace published a, a report on the toxic dyes or the toxic chemicals that fas fashion kind of puts out into the world, particularly in China. And um, a number of corporations were named in that and they've all taken action already. But it was it kind of points to the scale of the problem when H&M said that they are taking it all on, um, but it's going to take them eight years to work everything out. Um, that's how complex and, and, and deep the problem is. But I think it, going back to your answer, see there I went on a tangent again. Um, education I think is key because if, if you have conversations where you don't just point the finger and blame people, um, but rather have a conversation about what might be possible for them and their particular situation, people get engaged. And, um, and, and so that, that's my work cut out for me for my, until retirement, I think. But thankfully I'm not the only one doing that work. So. 
This is a, a question that was tweeted, and this is for Michael, and it says, does People for Urban Progress have a blueprint for others who want to salvage materials? And I'd actually like to add on to that. Um, as you were speaking, um, I was wondering if someone approached you and said, hey, I have a project, I'd really like some dome material, would you be willing to part with it? That is um, a good question, both of them, and, and kind of an ongoing um, conversation that we have in-house. You know, I think that we're still refining our blueprint because we think we're, we're close to having a model that, that can be duplicated. Um, although I get really nervous about having something that says, okay, this works this way, you know, and that can transfer to other projects. Because um, right now I do like how um, kind of flexible we are, you know, that we, we make decisions based on um, a number of factors and I feel like we're relatively nimble because we aren't following some sort of rigorous uh, blueprint. Um, in terms of, you know, other materials or people coming to us with, with ideas for other material or to use the materials, um, it's a really tough one because we, on the one hand, don't want to be stingy at all that we, we view these resources as something, you know, um, that should be put out in the world for people to use. Uh, but on the other hand, we, we very much believe in kind of the quality of reuse. Um, and I think, you know, there is a version where even just recycling is still not particularly responsible, you know, so we feel like just one more use ne isn't necessarily a better use. And so we try to invest in projects that really are, that have a much longer term um, solution or much or more of a quality solution um, and we haven't quite figured out a way to engage uh, the public that way because we, we don't necessarily want to scrutinize every single project that comes in um, and so that's that's still kind of a question mark we, we are better with um, communities and nonprofits that come to us with with a team and, and kind of willingness to tackle it and, and have, have done some research on the material itself uh, versus people that, you know, want some of the dome fabric to do an awning for their porch, you know. So. Um, this is another uh, tweeted question, and it says, um, well, someone actually mentioned that consumer awareness um, is a missing piece when it comes to waste and fashion. So how can consumers make themselves more aware about how much waste happens and perhaps which brands waste the least? Any tips on research or resources? Um, I'll do the consumer awareness first. So um, really I think, and it's not just fashion, but everything that we own, um, it, it goes really back to that decision-making process. You know, when you decide to throw something to that place called away, um, um, you know, have a it's worth actually stopping to think about why you're doing that. And I'll give you an example. Um, a colleague of mine, Otto von Busch, um, he's an amazing Swedish guy. He did a project a few years ago somewhere in Europe, I forget. But um, it was a, basically a clothes swapping event where people got to bring in clothes and, and that they no longer wanted and, and, you know, get new ones from other people. But the twist to this particular clothes swap was that people had to write a paragraph at the event about where they had got the garment that they were about to get rid of, where they had worn it, and what it had meant to them. And what ended up happening, most people didn't actually end up leaving any garments behind. They took them back home once they'd had that thinking process. And, um, and it kind of points towards the fact that some of our decision making can be, I don't know if flippant is the word for it, but, but, but we're just surrounded by so much stuff, like just in our homes. I mean. How many of you have a storage unit? Because <laughs> um, I used to have one, and um, it was, you know, excavating through that when I got rid of it was an interesting experience. Um, but I think really just engaging with the things that you have around you is the first step. Um, that's where a lot of the awareness will come from, I think. And then to the kind of ways that I talk about, that 15% that because that's completely invisible to consumers. That's where I, people like me come in and we need to talk about it um, to the consumers as well as to the industry so that people are more aware. 
um, because most people don't know that the clothes that they're wearing, there's this other missing piece that got lost along the way even before those clothes were in a store. And that's, you know, that's what I, I talk about as much as I can to everyone that will listen. And even if they're not listening, <laughs> I'll talk about it. Um, so I, I think that, that responsibility also is falls on people like me. Um, what was the second part of the question? Um, resources. How, how can you learn more um, about people who are practicing, um, that have good practices or that are wasting um, as little as possible? Um, there is a lot of research to be done and one of the challenges there, especially when it comes to consumers trying to find out things, there's still some companies out there that will try to benefit from from you know being branded as sustainable and and you know the thing to remember is nobody can do anything perfectly everything will always have an impact even the most um, considered companies and there's some incredible companies like Patagonia who are doing just amazing things and have been doing amazing things for 30 40 years even they acknowledge that they still have problems in the system but um but one of the challenges is that there's misinformation out out there as well and my suggestion there is try and get information from a variety of sources and then compare it and really look at where that information is coming from. And, and I probably shouldn't say it, but I tell my students never to believe a press release. <laughs> but, um, um, because sometimes I've seen some misleading information on, on press releases. But I mean, again, that's not a rule. That's just sometimes. I would maybe just only add, um, making something yourself teaches you a lot about how much you waste. Um, and I think we discovered this quickly as we, you know, we're prototyping a lot of our first um, products that um, once you have, once you see a material more as a, as a raw um, or unmade thing, its value suddenly changes, I think, you know, particularly if you go and buy fabric, if you screw up, then, then, you know, that, you know, is essentially potentially wasted. And so, um, it makes you, uh, pay a lot more attention to how you cut something, how you make it. Um, and, and we have, we have this box in the studio that all of our scraps go into and we just look at it like, well, how can we scale down and make something even smaller? You know, like, you know, it just keeps going down and down and down and, you know, we, you know, make bookmarks now, <laughs> you know, just to have something, you know, smaller to make. Um, so I would say make something. Yes, um, in the red. And there, there actually is. There's, um, if, if you Google fabric waste, um, there's a whole lot of companies that come up that just deal with that. Um, and sometimes that is the best solution. Um, my, I would argue that a lot of the time it's better to try and avoid creating that waste in the first place because, for example, um, um, recycling natural fibers is problematic because the fibers, through the recycling process, the fibers tend to get shorter and shorter and shorter. And, um, and it's difficult to make um, 
high quality thing, like basically the quality of the kinds of yarns and then fabrics that can be made from the shorter fibers that that goes down as that process goes forward with synthetics um, recycling is a whole other thing because there's no degradation in the quality so polyester for example is just about infinitely recyclable but then there's a whole lot of considerations with some of the but there's a chemical called antimony that's used in a lot of polyesters, which is a carcinogen, and um, that causes a whole lot of problems. And then also polyester recycling can be incredibly energy intensive, so it takes up a lot of energy to recycle polyester. So recycling can be problematic, but sometimes it is the best thing. Um, but because the kind of zero waste fashion design that I do is not appropriate for every situation, and that's I think and. Another thing to remember that there there will, won't ever be a one one size fits all solution. But you touched on it. You started on a brilliant point about collaboration. Um, that's key, and I probably should have had it in, in here. So thank you for that, because already there's some barriers breaking down. Um, I mentioned a, uh, through during our lunchtime conversation, um, a friend of mine has a small fashion label in New York. And two years ago, she actually posted on her blog the fabrics that she was going to use for the following season um, with the hope that other designers would see it and also want those same fabrics because she couldn't meet the minimums required by the mill. And um, she couldn't afford to buy the amount of fabric that the mill required her to buy. So she was hoping to team up with other businesses so that together they could meet the minimums. And that's unheard of in fashion because in fashion, people... If you go to a fabric fair, fair, there's a big one in Paris twice a year called Premier Vision, where designers go to buy their fabrics. People will walk around, like literally, with the swatches in, stuffed inside their clothes so that the other designers in there can't see what they're buying. So for someone to post it on, on the website saying, this is what I'm going to do next season, it's, and I actually pointed it out to my friend Tara and said, do you realize how unlike fashion this is, that what you've just done? And, she hadn't really thought about it. She was just really wanting to use those fabrics. So, um, but I, that's a form of collaboration that I'm pointing to, and and also some of the barriers. Because as a fashion school, you know, we we're in competition with all the other fashion schools, but there's also already some barriers breaking down around that because we're all recognizing that the problems are much bigger than one person or one school. So, it's absolutely key. Um, yes, what's your It doesn't really matter economically at all to most companies because the way the system works, it's factored in. Um, because really, the, the, a garment is costed on... So say, for example, a garment takes two yards to make. Um, that's what's costed into the price of the making of the garment, those two yards, including the 15% that is wasted. So the, re, the, the only saving really for a company... Um, well, actually, no. Some of the zero-waste garments that I've made, I have found that they do take a little bit less fabric as well. But really, the, the real cost savings would come from waste management practices but, or, or savings in waste management. But often, the fashion company isn't responsible for those costs anyway because everything now in fashion tends to be externalized. So. Yes. It's actually worse than that because it's not it's not last year's anymore. It's like last week's. Like the cycles coming becoming faster, and I I personally stopped following it a long time ago because I haven't really be believed anything that a fashion magazine says for many many years now. Um, because it is desi designed for that. It's designed to make uh, to sell more things. And just re I was in Finland in March, and I actually saw the cover of a fashion magazine. One of the top 
to uh, head headlines on the cover was Leggings Are Out. And on the cover they had these two fashion, Finnish fashion designers, both of them were wearing leggings. And so there was kind of this disconnect between the cover image and one of the things that the magazine was putting out there. It's like, does anyone check these things? It made no sense. Um, but yeah, the whole industry is geared towards that. Or, and has been for a long, long time. I mean, the, and it's crept into other industries now because you can see car, you know, you can get car, your car painted in this season's colors. And that language is very much from fashion. Um, and, you know, there's interior design magazines that will tell you to throw everything out every six months and buy new furniture and, and so forth. So it's, but it really started with fashion in the 1860s. And the whole notion of a fashion season, that was actually initially linked completely to the European court system because in the court courts they would have like a winter season and a summer season and, and the people in the court would need a new wardrobe for, well they didn't really need it but they thought they did. Um, <laughs> um, that's where the idea of making um, redundant the previous season came from initially but then it's sped up and there's people like Donna Karen I've heard her speak at an event two years ago and she was saying that she was spun out by the speed at which things happen now and I've worked for companies where we would do a new collection every six weeks or or rather a new drop of clothing would be um, dropped into the stores every six weeks and with H&M and Zara it's about three weeks the cycle is about three weeks so if you go to H&M now and you go there in four weeks' time, you won't really see many of the same things. And that's a big, big, big thing that, uh, to, to solve, and it's going to need require everybody on board in the conversation. I will come right back to you. Um, this is actually a, a question for Michael. Um, and I'm going to add to this a little bit, but I've heard people make a comparison between Austin and Indianapolis as being similar cities. In fact, one person said Indianapolis is like Austin 20 years ago. And since you spend a lot of time there and you travel a bit I about... I think I might have said that. I'm, <laughs> I'm wondering if um, or what you see in other cities that are similar to projects that you're working on or do you collaborate with other organizations that are similar to yours in other cities to see if you can maybe trade the materials that you've collected or um, work together on similar or like-minded uh, ventures? Yeah, I think we... I mean, two things. One, as we grow, I think we're really interested in uh, like pup chapters opening in other cities. Um, I think, in a way, following a model similar to Architecture for Humanity, um, which has kind of chapters all over the world. Um, I think we see ourselves a little different, though, in that uh, you know, architecture for humanity is is kind of outward focused, and we're more inward focused. So I wouldn't necessarily want to go to um, Cincinnati, for instance, and presume to start an organization there to address their problems. Like I would want a pup chapter there to be made of people from Cincinnati, you know, um, and that we could help guide um, guide them in a at a more meta level rather than a kind of project level because we are so project-based that we're really place-based. Um, that said, you know, there are a couple of organizations I think that we look to for inspiration um, and we're starting to reach out to. One um, is a group um, we just made first contact with um, in Windsor, Canada, um, that is the city across uh, the river from Detroit. Um, and there's a, the group there is called the Broken City Lab, um, and they do all of these really interesting kind of urban scale installations that um, help the people that live in that city think about their city. Um, and I think unlike Austin, actually Indianapolis um, struggle, the public here I think struggles to be really um, uh, critical of the city itself, um, but critical in a way that's helpful <laughs> rather than critical in a way that's kind of um, complaining. Like I read the star sometimes and I feel like there's just a lot of complaining by the people who comment on the articles in the star. Um, and, and I think there's got to be a better way to, to approach that. Um, there's a couple other organizations, uh, public architecture in, in um, uh, San Francisco and um, a company, uh, Freitag, um, which is a, I think, Swiss company um, that uh, we look to kind of for product inspiration uh, as well. 
And the gentleman? Awesome. Jessica probably made it. <laughs> she said. <laughs> awesome. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah, we'd like to. I mean, we through the work we do, we learn all of these things about how uh, a city operates. And uh, with the seats, we learned um, that if you put a canopy uh, or a shelter at a bus stop, there's a whole um, a whole slew of additional uh, permits and requirements that go along with that. Um, and so we want that to happen, but this was kind of a, a first step in the right direction, I think. Um, and, and Indigo has been a great collaborator in helping us identify stops that are uh, big enough to have seats, but too small to have a shelter. And so we're, we're even like narrowing our focus that tight, you know, to say, hey, there are 30 stops that could benefit from seats, but they're too small to have a shelter. Let's get some seats there because we've all driven around the city and seen people waiting at bus stops, you know. Um, often in the rain, unfortunately, but at least now there's a place for, for people to sit. And um, it's great whenever I drive by this stop, there's, I feel like there's almost always somebody sitting there now, um, which is um, really thrilling, I think. There are two other uh, things that I wanted to ask. Um, Timo, you mentioned Zara, and I'm, in, I'm just finishing the uh, MDMK program at the High School of Medicine. And the Zara is one of the businesses that I Sorry, zero waste. Oh. oh. I think healthcare um, is a great example of an area where disposability is probably a good thing, um, but the systems, no, no it's um, the systems currently don't support that. So going back to what I said about polyester, a lot of the plastics that are used in in the kinds of things that you would use, I can't think of a single one right now, but um, they are recyclable, and that's where I think it's probably worth uh, investing in the energy and, and all the other resources to recycle all of that because there are, I mean, there are some very real concerns in reusing some of those things. Just um, um, Interestingly, hygiene is one of the things um, and our ideas, and this is going away from medicine where there are very real concerns, because um, then there's kind of the cultural ideas about hygiene um, and they are one of the sources of, of some of the problems that we have now, because laundering is actually where a lot of the sustainability impacts with clothing happen. Um, if you look at the whole life cycle of a garment, quite often the biggest impact actually is from laundering, which I didn't talk about today. Um, and there, there's been studies done where people have looked at the, the, the speed at which things get laundered now compared to 20 years ago, compared to 50 years ago. And, um, and it's completely interlinked to our ideas about what's clean and what's not. But medicine is a great example of where disposability, it's not necessarily just a good thing, but it's actually a necessary thing. And that's where we need to look at the kinds of systems to support the disposability of things in a way that's as least, uh, as least in impactful as possible. Um, I forgot what you, what the other... Oh. Yeah, no, and it really depends on, you know, the context in which that's looked at, because from a business point of view, that probably is a brilliant example of 
of operating, but there's some massive problems associated with that. But my hope with all of that is that all of that was designed, so if we could design one way of being once, we can certainly design new ways of being again. I mean, I remember H&M growing up in Scandinavia in the 80s. We actually went to H&M for quality clothes. Um, so I remember H&M in a very different context to how I look at it now, which is not that. <laughs> Yes. So, uh, I believe, I think maybe in this book here, I read an article, I've read some uh, articles, and you, I'd like to have you comment a little bit more on uh, fashion and no waste and how you can grade clothing. I, I can see that that could be a very difficult situation where you design something no waste in a size 8, and how, how does a factory make it in a 12 and still have food? A uh, great question, and th that's one of the more challenging ones for a lot of companies. Um, there's a number of ways around it. I think in my PhD, I, um, I identified five possible pathways to address the issue of sizes. Um, and then there's some very real-life examples. Um, in New York, Yao Li Teng has been making some zero-waste garments for about 30 years. Most of hers tend to be one size fits most, or she might do two sizes instead of the usual five or, um, or so. Um, in Australia, there's a company called Material Byproduct. They're based in Melbourne, and they design all of the sizes at the same time. And a lot of their garments tend to have a lot of either darts or tucks or pleats, and and Essentially, the pattern pieces for all the sizes are the same, but the number of pleats and gathers varies. And that, it, that suits their aesthetic. It's obviously not a solution that would suit every company, but, but it goes back to that thing that there's not ever going to be one solution that suits everyone. It's going to be about lots of different solutions that suit a variety of different people and, and also different consumers. Because the other thing that's missing from fashion is the diversity of who we are as a humanity. I mean, I had one of my seniors this year, she made her collection in size 12, um, which got labelled by other students a whole lot of not very nice things. Um, but, I mean, she, and I was totally supportive of her doing that, we even paid extra for a size 12 fit model to come in for, for her to be able to do that. And then two weeks ago, a stylist rang Parsons and said, have you got any students doing um, clothes in size 12. Italian Vogue wants to do a film shoot um, with two amazing size 12 models and all we had was that one student and um, half of her collection got shot. So it was, she, she got the last laugh with that one. Any other audience questions? Yes. It's um, basically the question was about have I looked at history um, of zero waste and um, I kind of left it out of this presentation I, I do do it in most of the ones that I do but zero waste is as old as clothing and in fact just about every culture around the world you can find, you start to find examples of very quickly and I believe there's even examples of it in here in IMA, like we, we walked through the African section earlier and, and I could already start to see how some of the things probably when you, if you looked at them in detail, you would see the zero waste aspect of them and, and Native Americans, the way they worked with the buffalo, I mean it wasn't just the way they worked with the skin or the hide, but everything got used um, from, from the bison and um, even in Europe, um, up until about a hundred years ago, certain kinds of garments, like most of the undergarments, um, which were shirts and shifts and things like that, they were more or less zero waste. And I've, I've got my grandmother's baby clothes from 1923, which are zero waste as well. Um, and so it's nice to see that it's, 
it, it, all that's new is the name. And I always make the disclaimer that I invented it. I certainly did not. The name appeared about four years ago, and it's like, oh, now it's got a name. I can give my PhD a name. Um, so that was nice. Um, but then I think there's been things that, and certainly I do take credit that I was one of the first people to formally research it, but I, it goes back thousands of years as a practice. It's just the name is very new to it. And it's, I, I, there's nothing wrong with that. I think, in fact, it's useful because it gives something for people to cross quickly and then get more of an in-depth understanding with. Um, oh, okay. We have a couple more questions and then, go ahead. I think one of our designers tried to make a jumpsuit out of, out of the material. Um, we have, our, the materials we get though are, are they are designed for the use, um, uh, their original use. They're, they're not, they're fabrics that are actually incredibly difficult to work with. Um, we, for example, we quickly learned with the, the RCA dome fabric that it's so uh, tough that you can't turn anything out, you know, so you, a lot of our stitching ends up being on the outside because it's, it's hard to flip. Um, we, we found with, I think it's like a, a polyester something uh, that's part of the, the Super Bowl material and it just is not comfortable. <laughs> um, you know, so there, there, we've tried a number of different ways um, uh, for clothing and and, um, and it doesn't hasn't seemed to work um, on the other hand though we, we do like with the accessories uh, there's something a little bit more uh, universally appealing you know that that more people are able to buy those items potentially that they don't have to worry about fit um, and I think for us that's really important as it relates to uh, citizens of Indianapolis feeling like they're able to own part of the city um, so for us, I think that that kind of fits with our mission uh, more directly than, than clothing does. I saw that you um, had made a cushion um, or a couple of cushions for someone's Airstream. Is that a, yeah. an area that you might move into to make furniture with salvaged materials? I think so. I mean, we've, um, yeah, I mean, the difficulty with furniture even is that you start, as you scale up, you start needing more materials. And for us, that means we, we feel compelled to, to source, responsibly source those other materials. Um, so like we made a cushion and the amount of foam that went into that cushion, you know, just seemed to not quite make sense to us. You know, that the, the amount of salvaged material was far less than the amount of new material that we were purchasing. Um, and so we're, we're trying to very slowly kind of um, come up with uh, ways around that. I think the best one so far is we needed a strap for our messenger bags um, and we went out to pick apart last year, uh, seven of us, and we spent three hours cutting seat belts out of all of the cars there. Um, and, and so all of our straps are now seat belts from, from cars. Um, they were having a, a great event where it was, I think, 40 bucks for all you could carry 20 feet. Um, and so we, we got like 220 um, seat belts for $40. So. Uh, there was another question, yes.
Um, can I answer that quickly? Sure. Um, it depends. There's, there are some great opportunities for different types of ways. So, um, cotton fabrics, for example, are a great resource for people that do quilting, which is one of those amazing American traditions. Um, um, the, I remember growing up in Finland in the 70s and the 80s, there was still a rag collection that used to happen. And I don't know if it's true, my dad used to tell me that they used to make banknotes out of it back then. Um, or certainly turn it into paper. And um, that, that no longer exists in Finland. But um, certainly it used to be like, there used to be systems that would facilitate that. And if you don't really have any other options right now, other than, unless you, you know, start really sorting it and send the cotton stuff to a quilting group somewhere. But really for the other stuff, right now, landfill is probably the only solution or like what Michael, you guys do and keep the scrap in that box and yeah, it's... I mean, I think <laughs> and then what do you do with it? Yeah, I, it, it's a challenge because you can keep scaling down and you're like, when, when have you done good? You know, and, and we wrestle with that constantly. You know, sometimes we just, we do end up throwing it away because, you know, the pieces are so small that we're like, well, in the grand scheme of things, we feel like we've done a really good thing. Um, uh, a couple of other ideas, though. I, I, th there's a relatively new fashion group here called Pattern, right? Um, and I don't know if anyone in that group, you know, that would be a good source, I think, to at least email them and say, I have this, or I, I generate in a month, you know, a trash bag full of whatever, you know, would anybody interest, be interested in taking it? Um, another thing, you, you mentioned the landfill, the, I don't know if anyone has toured the Indianapolis landfill, but I would completely recommend it. Um, we, we did it, I think, two or three years ago because we were curious to see where all of our, all of the materials we were salvaging were going to go. Um, and apparently Indianapolis has one of the most high-tech landfills in the country. Um, and I think with things like, um, cotton or wool or materials, um, that stuff gets, like, shredded and turned into insulation. Um, I know there as well, uh, the methane gas that that landfill produces powers a six and a half acre greenhouse um, and part of the Rolls Royce plant that's nearby. Um, anyway, it's a really fun tour. <laughs> so. But going back, you could talk to schools and kindergartens because that scrap can be great material for just crafts that take place in in those kind of. Because sometimes you just have to, you know, if the system isn't there to support you being more conscious, sometimes you do have to take the initiative and, and create it yourself. Um, and But then I think it's good to share about that when you do do that, because eventually, the, you know, the word will get to those that can create, start creating those systems. And you'll probably find that there's other people dealing with exactly the same thing as you are. I started blogging about my research in 2006 and straight away other people who were doing exactly the same thing around the world started emailing me which was mind-blowing because at the same time I was being told that it was all pointless <laughs> and impossible so it was nice to hear from others who were also working on the pointless and the impossible. I uh, Yes. I'm not sure. I think they, I know a lot of it comes from automobiles. Uh, so when they shred an automobile, all of the, they're able to separate the fabric and foam from the uh, metal. Right. Yeah, I'm not totally sure. I know a lot of that um, relates to automobiles, um, but I do remember being surprised at how much more they sort there than I than I thought that they they would. So. And sir, this is our last question. Quick, yeah, quickly, um, have you guys tried a belt? And if you're looking for more dome material, Minneapolis just approved a new stadium, so there. I know. I we we actually. Um, we didn't get in touch with them, but we, that, that dome and the one in um, 
Vancouver are the same. And interestingly, before the Viking Stadium collapsed, uh, or that roof collapsed a couple of years ago, um, like uh, two weeks before that happened, a company in Minneapolis actually bought Vancouver's roof. <laughs> And all of that material was being transported and they called us briefly to consult because they bought the material not knowing what it was and we actually shipped them samples of our material. Um, and so it was like in, in a span of like three years, there are like three of these things coming down and we just, I mean, we cannot have any more material. <laughs> I mean, it's just too much, you know. Um, we have thought about belts though, yeah. Maybe Parsons wants it. Um, so <laughs> I think that uh, we should actually end where we began, and that would be with education. Um, and since this is a, a, an indie talk, I think it's important for all of us to leave here tonight and go home and talk to our friends and families about what was discussed this evening um, and the work of these two um, brilliant gentlemen. And I thank you all for coming, and have a nice evening.